Thanks very much for having me up. Uh, or down, should I say. I don't know whether it is. Horizontal, if you like. Um, um, as you probably are, you know, Ian Brown. Um, past member of the New South Wales Agricultural Society. Graham dragged me along when I was about 19, I think. Yep. The first one. Because I rescued just some, a whole lot of his lorikeets from a dirty big carpet snake. You did too. Remember that one? That's right, I moved in a tarmac. Yeah, and so did a diamond python. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah. He didn't know what to do with it. His wife Susan at the time didn't know what to do with it. So um, I grabbed it and put it in a fish tank and looked after their birds for a while. <laughs> anyway, that's when I met Graham. And um, I came along to the New South Wales Abbeys for quite a few years. And um, yeah, remember the times when it was standing room only. Belmore, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Back in the old days. Fair times have changed and obviously. Um, you know, that's one of our challenges we have these days is um, you know, having a market for our birds and, and, and the people keeping interest in it and, and getting young people interested in the birds is one thing that um, we're finding difficult. Um, the internet and all that sort of stuff, people, kids tend to find something different to do. Um, as a result of being a member of the Abbeys back in the day, and, um, I, showed, I, I gradually got an interest in a whole lot of different species of birds. I originally started off with parrots, you know, just Australian native parrots. And um, at Pheasant's Nest, when I grew, where I grew up on the farm, I might have had, what, 40, 50 aviaries, I suppose, at yeah. Yeah, one stage there, um, with a, quite, a, quite a wide range of Australian native parrots, um, from cockatoos down to near famous, and always had a lot of um, success. Moved up to Queensland about 20 years ago, 21 years ago now, and totally different climatic conditions and all those sort of things made it a real challenge. And um, when you're keeping a mixed collection, there's lots and lots of challenges, but I think the rewards sort of outweigh the challenges in a long way, compared, you know, considering what I'm allowed to keep or what, we, you know, what I've been able to keep and, and breed over the last 20 years up there. Um, one of the big challenges we have out in Queensland is the um, National Parks and Wildlife, as you like to call it, um, with regard to real, um, limited softbill species, which is really what interests me at the moment. Um, maybe 12 species of softbills were allowed to keep, as opposed to, I don't know, how many have we got here? 60, 70, you know, who, who can count the number of species we're allowed to keep here in a way of softbills? We've got four species of wren, one species of honey eater, a wild bird, a magpie, uh, I think we can keep banded clubbers, and, uh, what else, oh, spotted pardalots. Has anybody got any spotted pardalots? So, as I move on, we'll go through the challenges first, and then at the end of it, we'll show you all the rewards of having all these birds, but all these, you know, the species that I can have. Obviously, challenges are the types of aviaries that you have for these birds. Um, having, I keep fruit pigeons, softbills, finches, and parrots. So basically, everything we get except for raptors. You know, I can't. I, we're not allowed to have them in Queensland anyway. So I have a, quite a, a number of aviaries at the moment. Um, this would be the main aviary that I have currently running. Um, it's 160 square metres, this planted aviary here. Um, attached to that there's five conventional parrot type aviaries. Uh, there's six smaller uh, finch type breeding flights. Um, we have a big rat problem and carpet snake problem up in Queensland, so I run a lot of electric fences around everything, as you can see. Um, all the iron right around the perimeter of the aviaries is um, buried in the ground up to six or seven hundred meter, uh, millimetres. Uh, electric fence running along that as well. Quarter inch wire for about five or six hundred mil. Uh, once again more electric fence wires. And then finally a, a nice bit of a cap over the top of that so that if the power goes out and something does happen to run up there, they're going to have a bit of trouble getting up. I mean I could probably just go and have that and have no issues because the majority of all the um, the, uh, the, the above ground or above wall netting, obviously, is all nylon hail netting. Um, I'm finding that really good, really cheap to use, and it saves damaging birds like you wouldn't believe. I don't have any problems with birds hitting the, hitting the netting and knocking themselves dead, because they just bounce off it like a trampoline. Young birds, when they leave the nest, the bigger pigeons, the fruit pigeons, one person. What about on that. outside birds trying to get in? Yeah, they bounce around on top. I got, before I work out how to stop the hawks from getting in. The hawks would bounce around on top and, and try and tear at it. Never ever had a hawk take a bird. 
Um, have lost a couple of finches through butcher birds, been able to hit it, but you're going to lose them in steel ovaries anyway, unless you use quarter inch mesh all the way around. Yep. And prices wise, you know, running everything on quarter inch mesh to keep the mice out, the snakes out, and the butcher birds out is prohibitive as far as, the, you know, com considering the size of ovaries that I do keep. This is what I use now to deter the hawks. Alright, that's a 300mm stainless steel, they call them gazing balls. Alright, so you can see how reflective that is, you can see the roof there, and you can probably, if you went up close, you can see me just there, standing there taking a photo of it. Very reflective, and hawks will fly in, see their own reflection, yeah. and think there's another, and think that's another hawk, and this is their area, because they're all territorial, and the, the new hawk will just keep going. And since I've had, I started off initially with one ball, and for a while it worked, and then we got a couple of young sparrow hawks and a couple of young goshawks come in, thinking that they'd be able to mate up with that one bird that they saw, into their, <laughs> which was their own reflection, and so they hung around a bit and bounced around on the ovaries again for a while. Never really lost any birds, but a few of the birds actually got stressed a bit. Um, then I thought, well, you know, if they can see one bird, if I've got two balls, one at each end of the Avery, they're going to think there's two hawks in there, that's a pair, I'm getting out of here, and that's exactly what they do. I haven't had a hawk land on my Avery's in 18 months since I've had two balls up. So, pretty lucky. Um, the other thing that's good to have around is a few, and I mean up to half a dozen maybe noisy miners, because they tend to chase hawks around a lot as well, and they'll let the other birds know, or let my birds know when there is a Raptor around, and my birds will go to ground or hide in the bush. And there's plenty of bush in these aviaries at the moment. So, if you want to get rid of hawks, they're about ninety-eight dollars a piece, and you can buy them from a mob in Brisbane. Come and see me later, and I'll give you the the details. Um, obviously, being in a, you know, having a big aviary, you're going to need somewhere to catch the birds because there's no way I could wander around inside this aviary in particular uh, and catch any birds out with a net. You know, I've got that much bush and that much tree and they would be ducking in corners and whatnot. So, um, three metre by three metre um, aviary basically built inside the main aviary. That is also the only piece of shelter in the 160 square metre aviary. Everything else lives out in the bush, under the trees, under the leaves. When it be pissing down rain or boiling hot, they're just out in the, in the scrub. If they don't survive, they're not strong enough and they're not going to be good breeders in the long run. So, everything I want it, you know, when I've, everything gets fed in this aviary, um, the door is always open so that the birds can go in at will whenever they want. If I want to catch something out, I used to stand outside the aviary with a piece of string and watch wait for them to go in, pull the door shut. That worked for a few times <laughs> until they realised that if he stands there and holds onto that bit of string, you know, if he stands there, I'm not going in that door because there's this big bang. If I do, so I'll stay away from it. So then I put the string going inside the other walkway, and that worked for a little while. And I got sick of this waiting around for them to come around. I knew they had to come in sometime, so now um, either on the door or just above the door at the moment, just a funnel trap. So I close the door, I'll put a bowl of water in there, close the door in the morning. The little birds go through the funnel trap, can't get out because they don't know how to fly back in the end of the funnel. And I just walk in there in a little three, three metre by three metre aviary and catch what I need. Piece of cake. So I don't go chasing birds through the, the scrub and whatnot. Um, so the aviary is pretty well highly planted. This particular, this just, just this one. Um, obviously, you know, natural perching. I don't like any of these dowels or anything around the place. So it's all got to be natural perching as much as I can get. Plenty of growth, plenty of shrubbery. All sorts of different plants, grasses, grevilleas, bottle brush. Um, the big thing at the moment is um, a sandpaper fig tree. It's fruiting like crazy at the moment, so the wampoos are hoeing down the, the, the sandpaper figs and the silver eyes are going the figs, so they're ripening up. Um, also, they're dropping on the ground and bringing in a lot of fly, you know, like a vinegar fly type bugs, so the wrens and the other things are eating all this sort of stuff. Um, once again, it's just a really nice, well-planted aviary. And nylon netting, 
you don't even see it hardly sometimes, it's that invisible. And because there's, there's no structure, um, if you might have seen from the first photo that all there was was two posts, there's one there, with a big round steel cap on the top, just holding the netting up. So the netting's fairly tough? Yeah, it's very tough, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, I've got some new overs that I'm building that I can walk across. It's that good, so. I well, would walk across this one now because some of this netting is probably 35 years old. Oh, really? Yeah. That's stuff I got from Thilmy. And I first, yeah, my first, I first, the first aviary I built with nylon netting was down in Barrel, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, that, same, so same, it's the same, same. netting. <laughs> so it's over That's 35 amazing. years old now. Twice the length. Yeah. Of life that they say exactly, yeah. For, for that, and I can still push on it and pull on it, and <coughs> the only thing that's been able to get through it is rats. And I finally, over years of years and years of um, what, learning about rats and finding what they're getting and, and doing that, you got to know your enemy to control your enemy, and I've managed to do that now. I think. So, copies that like the sulphurs and that. Or gorillas wouldn't chew. Um, we don't get them. When we do we do get? We get. Yeah, you know, we get a few on the aviary, and I've never had them. Sort of never noticed them pulling through or trying to chew it or anything. Um, I kept princesses and all the lorikeets and whatnot in that aviary at different times, and never had anything chew through. The only thing I haven't sort of haven't put into the nylon net yet is fig parrots because they can chew. I'm just <laughs> not game. I'd love to have them in the big aviaries. But I'm just not game at the moment. We'll get no to that later on. Um, so, keeping a, high, a wide variety of plants because you've got a wide variety of birds helps out. Um, the fruit pigeons, the one poos and whatnot, for instance, eat grevillea flowers, which is something I didn't realise. You know, um, they eat the, the, the soft tips off the lily pillies, that sort of thing. So they're not actually eating fruit all the time; they're eating veg vegetation. And I think that's one of the reasons. It's one of the things that we've been finding with the fruit pigeons is. People keep them on a totally fruit diet, and they're becoming, you know, you know, um, have, have diarrhea problems and, and that sort of stuff. So dehydrate because they're totally runny all the time. Um, since I've been watching them, I've cut that down, and I'll talk about that when we get to the feeding side of things. Um, security cameras inside the aviaries for special species, you know, obviously pointed at nests to decide what, you know, to work out what's going on, particularly with the wampoos. And we'll go through some of those issues later. Um, also, got security cameras on the outside, so as I can see what's happening at night time around the outside. Um, that's how I found out where the rats were getting in. Um, I'd done everything I could to stop rats getting in while I thought. And one night, first night with cameras on the outside, find them running up a star picket, which is about a half a metre away from the aviary itself, running along the barbed wire and actually balancing on the barbed wire and jumping across onto the capping and then running up the netting up the top, get under the roof because there's a double roof and because they're out of sight there they can take all their time they want to chew a hole in and they do that every time. Fortunately you never lost any birds due to rats unless you call the snakes following the rats in taking the birds. Could be due to rats I suppose. But that's what had happened. In the same, the same night that I saw the rats jumping from the barbed wire onto the aviary and over Caught the glim you know, caught a glimpse of a carpet snake climbing, following the rats in about two hours later. So, yeah, things you do, challenges and whatnot that you find. Um, one of the second planted aviaries is um, the old above ground swimming pool that we had in the, uh, on the place. We put that in when we first moved there 21 years ago and it lasted, the line lasted about 10 years. And we decided to put a new in ground pool in. And I told my wife I was turning it just into a garden. <laughs> and it worked for a while, until she saw the framework going up. She said, what are you doing? Oh, it's all right, I'm just trying to, keep, trying to keep the wild birds away from these plants. <laughs> 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 but uh, it's, it's a nice, look, it's a lovely little aviary. It's um, nearly five metres wide. Um, in the middle, it's probably about three and a half metres high. And about nine and a half metres long. I just converted it, just chopped it up, you know, chopped the end off and put a square end on it and framed it all up. Everything on there was second hand material. Um, so it came up really nice. Uh, really thickly vegetated at the moment. Um, 
lily pillies in the background here, there's like gorillas in amongst them, some grasses, bottle brushes for the honey eaters, um, and it's a really nice, you know, very presentable aviary, because I can sit up here on the step and just sit there and watch stuff happen, and it's really nice. Inside the back end of it, obviously, once again, I'm not going to be able to go in there with a net and try and catch stuff out. So I'm going to use feed station, just with the drop door. And the similar things happen with the drop door as what I did with the, door, the, the pulling the door closed down the back. I'd sit there with a bit of fishing line, wait for the birds to go in, because they were used to me sitting there until the bloody thing goes bang all the time when you drop the, the, the cage front down and catch them in and then buzzing around. So they got... They wouldn't go in there when I was sitting in the walkway, you know. And so then I'd drill a hole in the in the door and stood outside with a bit of fishing line and next door neighbours would see me up against the wall like this, you know. <laughs> wondering what I'm doing and I'd get a sore eye from looking in this tiny little hole. Um, and then I eventually did the same thing as I did down the back. Um, in the in the actual um, cage front door just made up a funnel trap. Just a funnel. The birds would go in and obviously have trouble coming out the funnel as they would normally do. And then just catch them out as you want. Um, but having it nice and planted and you know the odd rock in here for the spin effect pigeons to stand on and things like that. Um, just ended up being a really nice cave and breeds quite well. Um, the birds feel nice at home. Um, also had a few suspended cages over the years as everybody does these days with parrots and whatnot. Um, Basically just attached them to the back of that aviary recently. Uh, they were down on the back of a big aviary originally uh, because I've got some development going on down behind that big aviary now. Um, I moved these up here. And you know, if you can design a framework that'll hold up the suspenders, you've got nothing going to the ground. So there's nowhere for rats to climb off anyway. Uh, electric fence once again running around on the corro that's already in the ground. Um, and it's just a cantilever type of setup and each of those cages will pull out, slide out if I wanted to, you know, to replace them or just take them and get them out of the way. Um, and there's a few different things in all of those at the moment. Um, easy access. This is only sort of temporary access at the front of these at the moment because these doors were actually in the walkway of the bigger aviary. Um, so you could go in and you wouldn't have any hassle. So at the moment I'm just a bit careful and a bit wary of what might get out the doors, but I'll eventually, um, at the end of this breeding season, um, have access through the walkway um, of the inside of the swimming pool aviary itself. Um, another few more just suspenders hanging around just for, you know, off, oh, you know, like odd birds and whatnot. Never raised these for any breeding or anything, just for holdings, you know, spare birds when I needed to. Um, the conventional aviaries down the back, these are the ones that are attached to the main 160 square metre aviary. These are your conventional you know, 1.8 wide, um, 5 metre long, 2.4 metre high conventional parrot aviaries. And um, what do parrots like to do? They like to sit at a perch at that end and to sit at a perch on the, in the um, shelter end and you've got all that wasted space. There's nothing going on because I mean, even though I love parrots, to me, parrots are just a picture hanging on the wall because that's all they do. They just sit there all day on the end of the perch and don't do much else. You know, they'll go to their food bowl once in a while, have a feed, and go back and sit on the perch and preen themselves or look there and go to, sit there and go to sleep. Whereas your finches and your soft bills, they're forever moving around looking for feed to keep themselves going. So I had all this space and I wondered what to do with it. How could I use it and utilize that space? without being too much of a detriment to what was going in there. And of course when you've got soft bills and, and finches and whatnot, you need you know, brush and, and bush for them to hide in and hopefully some plants and whatnot. And what's an ecky going to do? Tear the shit out of whatever you put in there. <laughs> so, come up with a solution. The bottom quarter of the aviary, uh, mesh it in with two inch square mesh and put all your plants inside there and, and cylinders for brush and breed superb fairy wrens in there, along with eclectus parrots. Um, or crimson finches in, in the same aviary as the superb wrens. In the, so I'm actually using a bit, I can have more species in that same space. So that was one of them. 
Um, of the five overs, I did it with all of them. Um, it just it made life so easy. Currently, these are just full of um, grasses that are just overflowing the place. So, you know, the crimson finches are breeding like crazy in them. Um, the, the fairy wrens have been using them a lot. You know, they're in and out all the time, and they can just. I've seen, you know, fairy wrens don't even stop. You know, they'll just fly straight through that two inch stuff. But the, the yekis or the gang gangs or the, the crimson, you know, the Palad uh, northern rosellas or whatever, princess parrots, they're not going to get through into that to destroy it. So it's a really good way of using mm -hmm. extra spay and making up, you're doubling or tripling your aviary use, you know, in, in doing something along those lines. Um, because they're in with big parrots, obviously, you don't want them eating all your. Um, you live food so much, even though it's good to have parrots that eat live food, you know. If you've got a pair of gangangs in this area here, and um, fairy wrens that you want to have living all day long, eating mealworms and whatnot, there's got to be something left. So you've got to be able to, you know, the fairy wrens can get in here, um, eat what they want, and the gangangs can't get in and eat at all. I always give the gangangs a bit up on top, but the, mainly the gangangs seed and everything is up on top uh, at the time, and the fairy wrens can get in and get their soft foods and you know, live foods and mixes and all that sort of stuff. Um, this old shed was the only other thing that was on in the backyard when we bought this property up at Burpengary. It was um, an, nearly an acre and the only thing in the backyard was that shed and about <coughs> eight cocos palms around the dam that used to be down the back. So got rid of the cocos palms um, and recently I filled in the dam and I'm building new areas on that but we'll show you those in a minute. So. You're just your conventional 6x9 gal shed, or whatever it was. Um, actually, now it's only 3x9, isn't it? Yeah. Or 3x6, something like that. What was that? Yeah, 3x6 metre zinc loom shed. Cut the end out of it, made up some aluminium tubing frame, quarter inch mesh. Uh, once again, the electric fence is going right around it. A bit of shade over the top because it gets pretty warm. And. Um, just framed it up inside, put some doors in, booters, a bit of a walkway down along the back, and I've got myself a quick, easy six flights for you know two pairs of finches per flight, or a pair of turks and a pair of finches per flight, you know, something along those lines. So nice little, they're a metre wide and maybe three metres long out to the um, to the veranda off the end. So they get a bit of outside stuff, they've got some inside stuff, um, works pretty well. You know, plant in a big pot, you've got some pit-pit grass growing there. Automatic watering, drain for the automatic watering runs down here, so you have a hose running into there to keep it watered, and the rest of the water runs outside. So everything stays pretty dry in here, and uh, just a little trickle comes out of the uh, automatic watering every day to water the plants that are growing in there. The medium is these, um, the inflorescence, which is the, the, the fronds that hold the fruit. Um, when they dry out, once the fruit's all dropped out, they dry off, and they're really hard and they hold their shape really well. These are foxtail palms, I've got a lot of those growing around, so they're really good. Turn them up the other way, hang them in your aviaries or whatever, and they're perfect um, nesting ports for finches. You know, there's plenty of branches and plenty of room for them to grow and nest <coughs> and whatnot. And even some of the other types, I can still put them in the baskets. And um, uh, they're Alexander palm fluorescents, so uh, they have you know, plenty of space for the birds to put their nesting material in etc. Obviously with a big mixed collection feeding is a real issue. I mean I've got that many things. So my wife got sick and tired of me making up food and washing dishes in the kitchen. Um, I decided I had to build a bit of a room in, in the end of my garage. I got a double garage down the back, one of the 6.9ers, so I, three meters by four meters, built it in, timber framed it myself, <coughs> lined it. Son or one of the daughter's boyfriends at the time was an electrician, so he ended up getting me a second-hand air conditioner, so that made it really handy. Um, the fridge and the freezer, microwave. You know, this is where I keep all my food made up and, and medications if I need them. You know, all your fruits, frozen stuff up in here, um, and frozen stuff here as well, so all the different you know, peas, corn and carrot and all that sort of mixes. Times have changed, I've gone through a different, you know, a few different methods of feeding out stuff these days. So I do a lot of these frozen tubs now, so I'll mix up, you know, a month's worth of chopped up fruit and veggies and freeze them in the individual 
um, Chinese food containers and I'll know one container goes in that aviary, one container goes in that aviary, however many I need on a particular day and gets fed out. And I just put it out frozen. The temperature up there stuff thaws out gradually during the day and that way it lasts a bit longer too. And I've never known the stuff to go soft and mushy like you'd think it would. Um, it doesn't seem to. Uh, I don't go and buy crappy or, or get given crappy fruit from fruit shops and whatnot. I just buy what I eat myself. So I could, if I wanted to, I could take one of those to work for lunch and eat it for lunch. Yeah, and I've done that before. Um, because in each one of those, and I'll show you in a minute what goes into those. But having all this stuff handy in the one spot um, saves a lot of backwards and forwards up to the house and back in, and and having it all there ready, you can just pull out of the fridge and start making it up as you want, you know. Um, and in this one here, we've got red mixes here, and the fruit and veggie mixes there, dried figs, diced up, any of the fresh fruit that I would have needed at the time, um, your, your finch mixes, your um, dry powdered mixes, etc., all frozen, frozen fresh figs in there, nectar blocks, we'll show you some of those in a minute as we get through, but bits and pieces of stuff that you need. Um, stainless steel benching, dishwasher, um, you know, hospital cages, etc. Everything you want to use is all there, so I'm not bothering the wife up in the in the house. And that doesn't happen anymore, so that's another story. Because um, I keep a lot of soft bills, another one of my passions is growing live food. So I grow my own mealworms these days. Um, I've got my fly, fly boxes for growing maggots. Um, this is the, just an old timber bookshelf that I use with a fly screen door I made up to go on the front of it where I put on my fly uh, pupae, or the, not the fly pupae, the, the young maggots when they're starting to grow um, and I harvest from there. Um, go through some of the things later. So that's what, how I feed, feed them. I wait for them to start pu <coughs> pupating. <coughs> Excuse me. And that way they're sort of, you know, they're pretty nice and white and clean and cleaning themselves out. Because there's nothing worse than giving, you know, half-grown maggots to birds that are going to swallow a bit of crap that's still inside the maggot. So we try and keep that out of them. Um, I breed a few crickets. I haven't had much success because I've stopped using this box I gave away a few years ago when I got rid of all my soft bills and now I'm getting back into it. I wish I hadn't given that away. So, um, but I'm trying different methods now, so... Um, that was pretty handy, you know, having having your own live crickets and whatnot and growing them. It's a lot cheaper than going out and buying them every week. Wood roaches are another good source of protein for a lot of the um, the soft bills, uh, and they are so easy to keep. You know, just a bit of pine shavings in a tub. So long as you get some of that fluon, which is the white. It's called. It's a Teflon paint. You can paint around the top of your inside of your containers, and the cockroaches can't climb out of it. All right, it's very slippery for some reason or other, and they just got no. So you can have open tubs of cockroaches in your bird room, and and the, these guys can't climb out of it. I also use the same tubs when I'm feeding them out in the aviaries. So yeah, you know, they can't escape and go everywhere, and they're still you know contained in the area for um, feeding out. Um, white ants, sort of, it's getting really difficult up our way to actually go and find enough termites to feed your birds through the whole season, or through the whole year. Um, so I've been you know, thinking about it and sort of growing my own termites, so to speak. So I'll get a, um, I'll go out and find the smallest termite mounds I can find, something that I can get out in a whole shovel full, right? so it's a whole mound there, and stick it in a bucket of um, wood chip or mulch, you know, just the forest mulch that you buy from, uh, you know, get from the local tree hoppers. Um, pop the lid in that, I'll pop the whole, um, nest in the bucket, put it in a tub of water so that it doesn't, you know, they don't go and raid your house, um, give it a couple of months and you'll be just pulling out handfuls of, um, and that's what I've done there, pull out handfuls of mulch with full of termites and that just keeps cycling itself. Uh, it works pretty well. I've now got it set up in a couple of bathtubs because uh, I can use a bit more um, and that helps well with the whole thing. Um, Moth traps, obviously live moths are great for your birds. Um, I made this one up just out of a ceiling fan and a couple of bits of stuff that I found and there's a black light above that. 
Um, the nets are just the fly nets that you use over your hats when you go out in the bush, so you don't eat flies, and you, know, you can drink your beer without the body getting flies in your gob. Um, this one was actually available at Bunnings there for a long time, so I bought a couple of those at one stage. Um, they used to have, they'd come with a you know, little stainless steel wire basket that hung on the end there, and the whole idea of those is that insects would get in and the basket would be so close to the fan that the fan would dry them out and kill the insects. I didn't want dead insects, so I just got rid of that basket and, and hung the fly net again on the end of that. Just pull that off every morning, go out and release it into the aim. Birds are loving it. Um, all these ones here at the moment are um, lawn grub moths. So all the neighbours around me are happy that I keep birds because they've got really nice lawns. Because the lawn grubs aren't living in their lawns. They're, they're, I'm catching them all before they get a chance to go and breed in their lawns. So. That's good. Um, external black light with a ceiling fan on the outside wall of the, of a particular, of the big aviary. So it comes on on a, third, you know, like a timer at night time. Insects get attracted to that, get sucked in through the half inch by half inch into the feed station area. Automatic live food next morning, you know. For the wrens and the softbills, I do a lot of um, supplement with some um, obviously commercial products if we can because you know sometimes you might run out of live food um, but you want to make sure they're actually you know they've got something else that they can eat and whatnot so the Ren mix I use is a mixture of um, uh, Veta Farm Insecta Pro, Paswell Soft Finch food mix, a bit of Madeira cake, a bit of cheese, grated cheese, mix it all up into a nice you know moist but not wet pasty sort of a, a mixture and then I'll mix that with um, some maggots and some mealworms and you get that little concoction there and all the soft builds, all the parrots, even seen the fruit pigeons having a go at this stuff too so there's a lot of good nutrition in it and obviously the birds are enjoying it and I'm doing pretty well with some of what I've got. Um, at, one stage there, I had a lot of lorries, and so I was feeding a lot of you know, your normal lorry wet, you know, your lorry dry stuff. Um, see, it's just some white millet, but we use a lot of um, the frozen French white millet that we can get up in Queensland these days, um, and a good quality seed, finch seed mix. Um, bugger all the sunflower at all through my place. None of the, none of the bigger parrots get sunflower at all. They're all got a good one, just a small you know, finch mix. I couldn't be bothered buying too many different mixes. So, you know, all the little seeds, parrots eat little seeds in the wild, they can eat little seeds here. You know, you don't naturally get sunflower out in the bush, so um, why would they get it from me? Um, pellets is another good thing that I've been transferred a lot of birds over to over the years, especially with the fruit pigeons. I know I can go away for a weekend and the fruit pigeons I know will survive and, and live quite happily because they're eating a mixture of uh, pellets. Uh, these ones being the Better Farm NutriBlend ones, the coloured ones, and the previous ones were the uh, Paradise pellets. So I'll tend to do, I'll do a mix of both nowadays because sometimes you might not be able to get the Paradise pellets, sometimes you might not be able to get the NutriBlend pellets. At least that way I can, I know the, the fruit pigeons are eating a bit of both. Um, a lot of the parrots eat them too, which is what they're designed for. Um, but I tend to feed mostly the fruit pigeons and whatnot on the pellets. Um, I breed a few scarlet honey eaters. Um, I was pretty lucky with those to be the first person in Queensland to breed scarlet honey eaters in captivity. And so I make up a, a nectar mix for those. And it's a mixture of uh, the Wombaroo lorikeet and honey eater mix and brown sugar. And depending on the time of the year, it will depend on the ratio of Wombaroo to brown sugar. In summertime, the Wombaroo tends to get pretty sticky and tacky. So I'll thin, I'll use less Wombaroo and more brown sugar in the mix. Um, in winter when the honey eaters are breeding, it's cooler so it's not going to get sticky. So I can put more Wombaroo in the mix and there's more proteins and more mineral, you know, more nutrients in the, in the Wombaroo to maintain the chicks that the uh, honey eaters are, are rearing. Um, I'll make up a two litre bottle of that. So there's probably 500 grams, maybe say at the moment, this time of the year I've got 200 grams of Wombaroo 
and 300 grams of brown sugar, mixed in two litres of water, um, and then freeze it in ice cube truck. So I'll pull out each day one ice cube per honey eater. Um, I've got a couple of other birds now that eat nectar as well, um, in the way of soft bills, and so I'm just using one block per bird a few days too. So um, I can have six months worth of nectar made up in my freezer if I wanted to, and not have to, you know, and just pull out enough each day. My neighbour's looking after my birds while I'm away at this, on this trip, and he's got a list of what he has to do, and he'll just go to the freezer and pull out three nectar blocks into that block tray and three into that tray, and those go in those ovaries. And I'll show you how I do that with the, with the neighbour too, as far as feeding out. This is one of the, the fruit mix and fruit and veggie mix that I use, so there'd be 17, 18 different types of fruit and vegetables in that. Um, I make, as I said earlier, I make up you know, 60 or 70 dollars worth per month in one dough, you know, in one go, so that might be 20, 30 kilos of fruit and veggies. Chop it up, dice it up, pack it up into Chinese food containers, put it in the freezer, and I can pull one out a day, goes in that tray, another one goes into that tray, another one goes into that tray, which then go out into the aviaries, and just let it thaw out itself during the day. Because there's pellets in there for the fruit pigeons, they're supplementing themselves with that, so I don't go and use copious quantities of fruit mix because they don't really need it um, and it was only giving them diarrhea originally so a lot of trial and error and slowed down a lot of things and it's it's working at the moment so um, I bred a few fig parrots <coughs> so obviously they're going to have figs um, I got on a mob one stage used to buy these diced up figs for the um, caking you know the baking bakery industry and I'd get a 10 kilo box of diced figs, I think at the time for 25 or 30 bucks. All right. And if I went and bought 10 kilos of these things, I'd have for two or 300 bucks. You know? So, um, yeah, what do you do? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, fortunately, you don't have to go through too many of these. I do collect a lot of native figs too for the fig parrots. I collect as many as I can when I see a tree that's got loaded of just collect as much as I can and freeze them and then just when I'm feeding each day or you know if I make up a, a, a few weeks worth of you know containers for the fig parrots I'll just put a handful of um, native, fi native figs in that <coughs> and um, they thaw out during the day and they all go well. Um, this is a frozen green seed which is a French white millet that we get there's a, a couple out at um, Lowood that actually um, so a whole paddock and harvest it for us and they actually freeze it as well Bo uh, um, put it into tubs freeze it up and once a year they'll bring in two or three pallet loads into Brisbane and all the Queensland Fish Society members will come and buy what they want for the year and take it home and freeze it mm -hmm. um, I know the Hunter Club um, they normally get one and a half pallets of um, this stuff sent down to them as well. I uh, don't know whether any more. Do you guys get it too? Yeah, they come down to Sydney too. Mm -hmm. um, 400 times more nutritious than dry French white millet. So because it's green, it's still got all the nutrition of it growing. You know, once it's dried out, all that nutrition has been sucked back into the plant, back into the ground, and that's when it falls on the ground and all they harvest it as dry seed. While it's green and growing, all the nutrients and all the energy and all the you know, proteins and whatnot are still in the seed. Once you freeze it, it doesn't go anywhere. It's still there. And they've done a lot of um, you know, testing and, and whatnot of it, and they, they believe it's around 400 times more nutritious than dried French white millet itself. We use it, at, you know, I use it sparingly. I'd probably go through 30 or 40 tubs of this a year, you know, maybe one a week. Um, but I mix it up with you know, greens and grains and a tonic seed and, and some soft food mixes and I just make up a, you know, a couple of you know, maybe 10, 15 kilos of it at a time and put it back into my containers and freeze it. I've got a few freezers running, that's probably where my electricity bill's gone. <laughs> um, just bucket it out when I go to feed cart around each of the individual ovaries. I think there's 26 feed stations at the moment at home. So um, it takes a 
doesn't take me long to do it really when I'm doing it. Um, pretty good. Um, one thing I've noticed over the last couple of years is that birds love, or especially finches and softbills love live flies. And I was having, you know, I'd go in there and I'd take a tray of live flies and let them out and they'd fly up and you'd watch them fly outside the edge before the birds got a chance to eat them all. So I had to try and come up with an idea of how to keep them in the aviary so the birds could still get them. So these are just a, um, the, the uh, diamond wire, but a really fine diamond wire mesh drawer out of a, you know, you build them yourself, you buy them at Bunnings. Those shelving kits that you can buy, you can just buy all the drawers separately. You know, you can buy whatever depth drawer you want for whatever slide, you know, whatever frame that you're building to put them in. You know, people use them in their, you know, their soft drawers and their under drawers and whatnot in their wardrobes. You know, for those sorts of things. So what I'll do is I'll just um, put a piece of core flute on the top of it to seal it. And I'll grew and screw, and screw and glue it there. Put a couple of hooks on it, and I can just go and hang that in the aviary. Cut a hole in the bottom in the corner that's away from the sunlight. Okay, so if you imagine if the sun's coming up there, I'll put the corner in this far away that the access is. Because what are the flies going to do? As soon as they come out of their tray, they're going to want to head to the light, which is away from the door. So, because the birds have got to be able to get in and get them and eat them. You know, just a perch hanging out the side, the birds will land on here, go inside, jump up, catch all the flies they need, and come back out. And the first things to go for these these days that I've noticed when as soon as I put flies in there is the black throat finches, and then the crimson finches, and then the scarlet honey eaters will go in there and the silver eyes will go in there and, and check down what they need. But at least they're not getting outside and going outside the net. You know, so you know <laughs> they'll stay in there longer, the birds get to pick and choose when they want them, um, and I've got you no know, issues. And to get them in there, I'll just get one of these Chinese food containers with the brood that we use to grow the maggots in, um, because that's what the flies blow in. Um, I'll have the lid on it and just cut a little, you know, a little um, a lip or a flap slot with a Stanley knife in the top of it, so you can flick it up, slide it into the fly box, leave it there for a couple of minutes. The flies will go in to try and lay their eggs in it, and you just put your hand in and push that little lap flap down, and then you can pull the whole tray out. Walk to the aviary with a container full of live flies. They're not going anywhere because they're enclosed in the ice cream, in the Chinese food container. Take them in, slot it in the hole, push it up one end, flick the lid off, take the lid back and do the next lot to go to the next aviary. And that way the flies will fly out when they want to, into the air and the birds have a chance to get every fly that basically goes into the aviary. And I don't have flies buzzing around the house and, and you know, annoying the barbecue and all that sort of stuff. Um, <coughs> I came up with this idea because I can just remember sitting on the lounge out underneath the pagoda or watching the birds and forever doing this. Where are all these friggin' flies coming from? Oh shit, I don't know. No, no idea, no idea. And it's all stopped now since I've done this. Um, because that swimming pool Avery, this is where this one is, it's right next to you know, the pagoda where the lounge is and I can sit back and have a beer now and, and not worry about going, having to do this all the time because the flies aren't escaping the aviary. Um, when I go away, I was having issues with you know, how my neighbour, my, I've got a really great neighbour, um, doesn't know a thing about birds. Old bushy, grew up on, you know, like had a banana plantation and all that, retired in town on, the, on his block next door to me. And um, always showed an interest in birds, but didn't know anything about them. And anyway, he said, uh, I said to him, any chance you could feed my birds while I go, you know, because I've got to go away for a couple of days, you know. Oh, I'd love to do that, yeah, that'd be great, you know. So I had to come up with an idea of how he could feed the birds, how I feed the birds. Alright, because that's what you want to do. If you go away for any time, you don't want somebody coming in there and feeding your birds. Oh, maybe these guys need that, maybe these guys need this. When, no, they've got to have that, and they've got to have that. Because that's how he would, you know, that's how I would have done it. I was going to feed them this. So, um, just some sheets of A4 paper laminated with circles printed on them. Each circle represents a bowl. Um, there's a, a list of what everything is. Okay, so WM is Ren Mix. Um, 
ZM is veggie mix, FM was fruit mix, um, LW is lorry wet, um, and there's a couple of other bits and pieces as you go along. So I just go along and draw with a whiteboard marker how much I wanted of each in each bowl. So he'd come in in the morning and he'd put all the bowls out where it says there's a bowl to go. So as you can see, there's two bowls there, two bowls there. You know, there's actually two bowls there. They're not being used at the moment. Uh, there's only one big bowl here for that big Avery, and oh, we've got an empty bowl here, so we don't need that bowl. It doesn't have anything in it. There's a bowl, and there's an empty spot there. Okay, so he'll come along. He'll sort the bowls out like that, and then he'll look at it and he'll say, "Oh, there's half a half a cup of lorry wet goes in that bowl there. What have we got? Three um, honey eater. That's HM. So that's the honey eater mix. So there's three ice blocks goes in that one. Um, so what have we got down here? We've got two spoons of veggie mix at the time, and a fig, that sort of thing. So he knows what's got to go in each bowl, and each bowl lines up with an aviary number 11, number 10, number 9, nine number 8, etc. And anybody that doesn't know anything about birds can come into my place, read the ledger, know where it is in the freezer, or the fridge, and put it in the bowls, and put it in that aviary. I went on a four week trip up to Cape York, we lost one ghoul in the inch. and I was breeding, we had all the fairy wrens that I could keep, I had honey eaters, I had all the fruit pigeons, and I was home, because I might have forgotten to do something, but because he had that list of stuff to do, he didn't forget, because it was all written there in front of him, he knew what exactly had to go in. Um, um, so it made it really easy, and, and then I went and I, um, we did a nine week trip out there, Kimberley, and I don't think we lost anything in nine weeks. I think I came back and there was babies full of babies because you know, we went in the middle of October <laughs> and he managed to buddy well, feed everything just right, and didn't lose the damn thing in nine weeks. So, I mean, that's what I would have wanted to do myself if I was home, but it was really good and a simple, easy way to do it. If you've got somebody that needs to look after your birds, do something like this. Gives them a bit of assurance and a reassurance that they can do what you think, what they think, what they need to know, know they need to do. All right. Once again, that's another another tray of them. So you know, as you can see, you know, if there's only one tray goes into that over, you can only put one bowl there because this is blank. Pretty simple. And then you get the rewards. All these challenges, all these different things you do, allows you to keep so many different birds and so many different species and have so much of a good time with you know, some of the birds. So, a um, number of parrots I've had in the past. Um, I had quite a good collection of foreign lorries. Uh, so these are black caps. Bred quite a few of those. Vicious bastards. Um, the only bird to ever fly out of one of those small doors into the walkway, fortunately. But all he wanted to do was tear my nose off. And drew blood and... Uh, <laughs> Um, I can remember one night, I could hear this commotion down in the Bay Avery's and I had night lights in the, in the walkways and it was about 9 o'clock at night and I could hear these lorries, these guys, going off their nut. So I thought, oh, I'd better go down and check out. I went down, opened the door, I went, oh shit! And they'd opened their bloody nest box and we're out in the walkway. You know, flying around, having a good old time flying down with the light. Oh shit! Um, just had some yellow bibs for a while there. Lovely birds. Goldies lorikeets. Not many of them left, if any, now. I think yeah, they're just about all gone, are eh? they? There's a few guys, there's about six blokes on there with them, but yeah, in the last them, year. Yeah. Well, Jordan also talked to him this morning. Yeah. <coughs> He's got one pair that laid one fertile egg, and that's the only fertile yeah. egg out of all these breeders at the moment. Yeah, Nothing shame, in 12 mate. months. Mm. Uh, the unfortunate thing about having all these foreign species that we're never, ever, 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 unless, um, we're going to get new genetic material for them. Yeah, so we've got to be really careful and really, we've got to work together, you know, to breed these species. Um, otherwise, they're going to be lost forever, you know. and. Even down to the little brown finches, you know, that people don't want. 
but we've got to keep them, otherwise we'll never have them one day. <coughs> Very lorikeets, these are in the big aviary, so they were lovely birds in the big aviary, you know, mm. with all the wild flowers, all the, you know, the grevilleas and whatnot <coughs> flying in there, just magnificent to watch them flying around in the big aviary. And bred really well in that big planted aviary, you know, constantly breeding, you know, three or four chicks in a nest and having two or three clutches in a season, just really good because they were actually having access to all this free range stuff. You know, extra food on top of what I was giving them, native stuff, you know, natural stuff. And it just made so much of a difference to the birds themselves. So yeah, you know, we breed, I breed quite a few. Oh, probably my favourite parrot at the moment, red brown fig parrot. Um, I started off with these probably eight or nine years ago. Started off with two pairs, paid a fortune for them. Had a few issues at the start, I think I bred 40 of them. So it did really well. Went away for that long nine week trip, so before I went away they were getting ready to breed. And I didn't want to have my neighbour worrying about them, so I gave, them, you know, put a, gave a pair to a mate down here and a pair up the coast. And I think they bred a couple while they were away, while I was away, so that was good. So. I've now got a couple of pairs back, so they're both sitting at the moment. So, um, but they're the most glorious little birds. If you haven't seen them in the flesh, they're one of the best little parrots you could ever have. But I tell you what, that thing will destroy you. Mm. These are the toughest bastards around. They bite like shit. <laughs> uh, so it's a couple of days old, and yeah, probably 24 is that now. Um, and that's when after they fledged. The only thing issue with these that I've found so far is because they're on such a fruity, figgy diet, their crap is really sticky and shitty. And as you can see, the right there, that ball there, attached to a toenail. Oh, that ball there, attached to a toenail. Um, I think there's a ball there, attached to a toenail. And that's what happens, you know, they're in the nest and they're picking up all this shit and it's building up, building up. So you've really got to pull them out, check your birds every couple of days, you know, just squeeze hard enough and you'll break that off and it'll just slide off their toenails, put them back in. And I haven't been able to get away from that. Um, it's just a diet, obviously. And because they do crap a lot in the nest, you know, they're not going to, they're not like soft bills and then the parents will take the poo sack away, okay. you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, cracking little birds. Eckies, this pair um, was probably the last, well, these are the last pair I had. I, I've given them to some friends now. I had them for about 15 years up in Queensland. I got them when I was, after I'd moved up into Queensland because once I, I wasn't allowed to take my own Eckies from New South Wales up into Queensland. National Parks wouldn't let you do it. So I had to palm them off to friends down here. Managed to find some up in Queensland, so I bought some. Um, parent raised every chick that they ever hatched. And that would have been, I think, in the, the time I had them, in the 15 years I had them, maybe 45, 48 chicks. Parent raised every one of them. So every chick came out. Now, who hand raised any hand Lots of people. Yeah, a couple, yeah. How dark are their males' be or their males' beaks? How dark are they when they when they, when they fledge? You know, still pretty dark and brown and whatnot. Um, this pair here, that was the day they fledged. So there's two chicks here, the day they fledged, and look at how good they are when you get parents raising them in the nest. You know, in that same aviary, I'd have superb blue wrens breeding and crimson finches. And then I've got some photos on my computer of baby fairy wrens sitting in between the, <laughs> the edges. And that's amazing, you know. Um, gang gangs, I was really lucky with this pair of gang gangs I had up there. I had them for a few years and they bred every year for me. Um, and in the same aviary, I was breeding splendid fairy wrens and pictorella finches. Yeah. And they were beautiful. First day they fledged, look at that. I mean, parent raised, gang gang chicks, absolutely spectacular. Um, this was a result, the, the brush in the back there was a result of previous experiences with them. They'd come out of the nest and they'd just go bang, hit that wire and go, you know, lucky I didn't lose any. 
Um, so yeah, all the brush up the back there, just above the the, um, the caged in section, the bottom where the, the splendid fair ends were nesting. Uh, never had any damage issues or anything with the, the gang gangs. Um, had a few Swiss parrots over the years, and they're a really nice bird too. I mean, you know, if you if you haven't had if you haven't seen Swifts, they're <coughs> so underrated, and yet you know they're so endangered in Tasmania. But I know guys that are breeding hundreds of these at the moment in captivity. And, Did um, you breed them? Yeah, saying? just once, which was really frustrating because they were in this big aviary, and. I had three pairs in this big aviary because you commonly breed them, and um, one pair went to nest, and I got a couple. Of, I think I only got three chicks out of the one pair. Made around the corner, you know, two metre long by 900 by 900 suspended with three pairs of swifts in it. Bred 30 odd birds in that, bird, in that same season. That's frustrating. Jammed in a tiny little freaking cage, and here they are in their own natural forest. <laughs> So sometimes it works with some birds, sometimes it doesn't. Um, yeah, it's what you learn over the years, you know. They might have just been these pairs of birds that weren't that crazy on it. Um, I want to get them back again. I haven't got them at the moment, but I'll definitely... Um, I've got my uh, feelers out for some pairs from Tasmania. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, yeah, I'll have them again next season. Um, one of the things I'm really concentrating on and passionate about is pure, normal neophemas. I've only got Turks at the moment because I haven't got enough room to have any other species because I've probably got 50 odd of these at the moment at home. All pure normals. Um, I've got one strain of pure normals that have got orange bellies. Um, and people think, you know, well, Turks, all pure normal Turks are like this one. You know, well, pure yellow, but there is a colony in central New South Wales that have been around for about 80 years, that do carry a bit of red in their belly. Uh, currently nine separate genetic lines of pure normal turks. And I'm breeding them pretty well, and fertility is excellent. I've got six chicks out of one clutch just fledged this week. Um, I've never seen six turks in the nest. And I didn't think they'd all last. These are the northern subspecies of crimson wings I had for a while. Uh, a lot smaller than the uh, ones you'd probably get out west out here, uh, over the ranges, but um, lovely little birds, a bit different in colour to the <coughs> ones you get down here as well. Red caps, underrated parrot, you know, one of the most underrated birds in, in Australia. You get tame ones of these, they're just stunning, bloody colourful birds, eh? Um, and they were really good parents too, really good parents. Under my soft bell, so I've had all the finches, all the wrens just about, except variegated. Now these are the superbs. The hen bird. And bred, I don't know, 30 or 40 of these in five or six years that I've had them. Splendid wrens. This is the West Australian one. Notice it hasn't got any black on its back. I've now got splendids again, and I was under the impression that mine were the normal West Australian ones too, but no, nah, they're not. They're black backs now that they're coloured up. But that's alright, like, black back hens are easier to get, because I haven't been able to get the West Australian splendids for, you know, in the, in the last 12 months that I've been looking, I haven't been able to get them. So, unfortunately. Um, probably bred 20 odd of these over the, the years that I had them. A little bit harder to breed than the superbs. Um, I felt that, um, yeah, still beautiful birds. That was the hen, and that was a nest. You can see they're different coloured eggs inside them. All um, emu feathers and, and cotton wool in the brush. Probably my favourite of the wrens is the white wing wren. Um, only because I've bred 70 or 68 or 70 of these guys in a few years. Um, I had one pair bred 31 in one season. And that was a pair that I had in an aviary that I ran out of room to take their young ones out, so I left the young ones in with them, thinking, oh uh, yeah, you know, if they if dad kills a couple of young boys, well, it probably won't be so much of a problem, but no, they're not, a, totally opposite. Um, the parents would go and mate, she'd lay, hatch the eggs, move on and start building another nest, while all the young, previous nest young ones would feed 
these young ones, and these young chicks grew so fast and quick. They were out of the nest in two weeks because they had you know, four or five foster parents, their you know, previous nest siblings, feeding them. I got to a stage in that one swim, in that swim pool over where I had 20 odd white wing fairy wrens, um, one coloured bird, and all the rest were uncoloured, even the males, none of the males even coloured up. Um, eventually, unfortunately, the hen burned herself out after, so it was a 31 chicks, um, and she passed on. Um, the cock bird never took another hen, and um, I've got, I had unrelated pairs, and I, I tried pairing them up, and he just bashed the shit out of them. So he, had, he, never, he never took another hen. And not one of his sons coloured up really while he was in, in, in that aviary. As soon as I moved him out, because one bird started to colour up and you could see them starting to bicker, so I thought, oh well, it's, it's cheaper for me to pull him out and leave these guys here. Once I pulled him out, the young cock started to colour up. And, but they never fought with each other, I think because they knew they were brothers, I suppose. Um, but I had two or three other pairs too, so I was able to farm out unrelated pairs. And do you think I can get any now? Yeah. Cannot find a white ring wren for sale or anybody with them to sell them to me. After I put, you know, maybe 30 or 40 pairs on the market over the last, you know, up until about three, three or four years ago, nobody seems to be able to do anything with them. I don't know what it is, why I could do something with it. Maybe it might have been just my birds that I had. Um, unless it was my husbandry, and I'm proud of it if it was my husbandry, um, because I've done pretty well with it. Um, but yeah, they are the bluest of blue things you've ever seen. Absolutely cracking birds. She was an angry shit. She used to stare at me when you come in the aviary, especially when she had young ones. You can see her tail's bent there. Uh, but the, the cockbirds are dating parents. They're just really cool. And won't have anything else near them. Especially anything blue. You know, so I wouldn't have tricoloured parrot finches or anything with blue on it. Cordon blurs or anything like that. These guys, as soon as they see them, they kill them within seconds. Um, but they got on with anything else that wasn't blue, which is fine, except young ghoulians. If a young ghoulian came within two metres of their nest, that young ghoulian would be dead. I uh, had a few issues with those, uh, but I'd still rather have them. <laughs> and they made their nest totally and wholly and solely 100% cotton wool or K-pop. Never put any grass or anything into their nest. Don't know why. Maybe because that's what they liked. Maybe the brush was nice and fine enough for them to be able to do that. Um, always had 100% cotton wool. There's a couple of day old chicks in there, two day old chicks or whatever they do. Grow so fast. Two weeks and they're out. A um, few silver eyes and a few times I've got them back again now. Lovely little bird. Scarlet honey eaters. They're just cracking birds. I mean, uh, as I said earlier, I was probably the first person in Queensland to breed them in captivity. Um, the first, this is the very first chick that was bred back about eight <coughs> years ago now. Actually nested in a um, uh, grenadier weaver nest. Uh, but they filled that hole from the bottom all the way up with coconut fibre. Um, and that was really good. So that was it coming out of the nest. And this is one of the other nests that they had later on. Work, please. I'll go back. There's a cockbird coming in with a fly, feeding a couple of the young ones, regurgitating some nectar, and then taking away the poo sack. Stuff you see that you don't get to see in a while. Yeah. And the fruit pigeons, oh, and normal, you know, like normal seed eating pigeons like the green wings. Spin effects. They're yeah, really lovely little birds. Really and notice they've all got long crests on them because I've got nylon netted aviaries and they don't bash their heads on steel. Yeah. Fruit doves, um, mm. bred a lot of purple crown fruit pigeons. Um, if they didn't nest in the trees, they nested on the ground. And I've got pairs that constantly nest on the ground nowadays for some reason. Um, that's a chick, first day fledged. <laughs> Alright, that's 14 days old. Uh, 14 days from hatching, you know, um, and that's out. Fully developed wings, fully developed flight feathers, and can fly with the rest of them. Absolutely incredible. And can land on a perch when it wants to. Um, <laughs> and bugger all on the rest of its body. And then 
It'll take another three weeks to get as big as parents. It grows so fast. Rose crown, yeah, rose crown fruit pigeons. Not as prolific as the superb or the purple crown. Nevertheless, I still bred quite a few of these. Um, the superb or the purple crowns, I think I've bred 60 or 70, I suppose. Um, yeah, and the wampoos. Um, probably the best bird that I've ever had, I reckon. Probably the rarest bird that I've ever had. The dearest bird I've ever had. Um, and I've been lucky enough so far to get seven birds on the perch. Top knot pigeon, but probably head to tail, probably a little bit longer than the top knot. Um, but yeah, pretty special to have them. Mm, right. And lucky enough to breed them, and because I had cameras on all my nests, because I needed to know what's going on, because I've lost so many, um, there isn't enough husbandry notes out there about these things. I've been trying to keep records of how I breed mine or how I bred them and when I've bred them and what I've done wrong the next time when I've lost chicks and all that stuff. Um, one day I'll put it down on paper. A lot of it's up here, unfortunately. Um, but this is, um, this is one, of the, one of the chicks that, we ra that raised, the parents raised. So it's one day old, probably three or four days, six or seven, eight or nine, 17 days old and off the nest. And, um, yeah, pretty happy with that. Yeah, spe spectacular little bird. Well, not little, mm. spectacular big birds. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, weavers, I've had um, pretty good success with some grenadiers over the past. Um, they're all good. And then a number of the finches, so uh, some red faced parodies, picarellas, mask finches. That's the normal masks, crimsons. Done really good with those this year. Probably got 20 odd young ones there at the moment. It's a female. Diamond fire tails. When you're in planted avis, you can take some really nice photos when you want to. Um, the Gilveray subspecies red browse. Some Gilveray again. Lesser red browse. And the ones right up on top of Cape York. Really different bird when you compare them side by side on a perch. White eat masks. Pure normal gullions. Uh, fortunate enough to have a good colony of pure normal black headed gullions. There's a couple of redheads in amongst them. And the odd yellow head. Those are all the ones I have in my main collection are pure normals. My grandson, eight years old, came to a finch meeting with me one or finch sale with me one day and said, Oh Pop, can I have a pair of birds? And I said, Your mum gave you the money, you can do what you want with them. So he bought a pair of yellow headed gullions. And the guy that bought them, he, we bought them off, assured me they were pure, normal yellow headed gullions. And there's a white breasted yellow headed gullion in the AV at the moment. So I'm not happy. Anyway. Black throated finch, that's the black rum diggles variety. Black rump double bars, they're from up in Northern Territory, Canada, the Kimberley region. Red eared firetails from Western Australia. Probably, oh, they're spectacular birds when you see them in the flesh. Absolutely glorious. And that's the end for now. Until I started building again. <laughs> <laughs> so. You can remember over here is the original big aviary, the big 120 metre, 160 metre aviary with the five flights on it. Well, again, 2.8 metres high, and it looks pretty big as it's going along. And this little video should work. So, corrugated iron buried six to seven hundred mil in the ground, the quarter inch wire mesh, 
um, up here for the earth, basically, for your electric fence. It's going to be running along there eventually. Nice wide cap on these ones to stop the rats if they do get up past this and onto the top. And the whole rest of it's covered in the near nylon netting, uh, the hail netting. I could actually probably walk across the top of that hail netting. It is so strong. It'll sag a bit for a while, but I reckon I can walk off and within a couple of days be back up to normal again. Good stuff. If you can keep rats off it, or the vermin off it, it's the best stuff you do. Uh, except for big parrots, of course. You know, any of the lorikeets, any of your neophemas. I mean, they'll fly from here and get and hit that end of that net and just bounce back off. One thing I will have issues with is, as you can see, the bush down the back, look how easy you can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to have to, when I put release birds into there, I'm going to have to brush it off a bit because I'm going to have birds go to smash and bounce off. I mean, they're going to bounce off, yeah, sure. But um, these are those are just the flights. This will be solid roof right across to the, the existing aviary and obviously divide it up through here. And this will be filled up with decomposed granite to allow for a lot more drainage, a lot more dryness. Because with the finches and the soft bills and whatnot, it's good to have a bit of dry stuff. Mm -hmm. There you go, man, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. No, <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is, we'll have supper, yep. but ask any questions in supper. Because it's, um, you know, but that was a great preso. Thank you. Too bad we had the AGM at the same time. Yeah. You know, <laughs> cool. but, um, but there you go. Yeah. But, um, excellent, and thank you so much. Oh, now, I've got something to give you on behalf of the society other than uh, associate membership uh -huh. per year and you get the electronic magazine and it's that. So have that. Uh, so someone's got a photo of me.